When Peter first asked me to do this, I literally, I don't have to do this very often, but he said, I'd like you to speak at a placemaking conference. And I'm letting him talk, and I'm Googling placemaking while he's talking, because I had no clue what he was talking about. And, but he sent me an email right after that, and he said, the, and I'm sorry to read your personal emails, but he said, the main reason we chose measurement as a topic to explore is because there's currently little agreement on what to measure. And honestly, there isn't even a great definition of what cre creative placemaking is. And I thought, this is perfect. I get to speak at something that really no one really knows what they're talking about yet. So how, I can't really go wrong with this. But it, was, it started to fascinate me, because as I was, re as I was listening to Peter and then re reading the, the email, I thought, this is exactly, it was like this deja vu. This is exactly where sponsorship was when I started in that industry in 1986. People actually had a difficulty defining what corporate sponsorship is. And it's hard to even think now, when we think sponsorship, we all know what, what it is. And we have a great idea, and we can give great examples. But back then, we didn't have those great examples. And the whole idea of measuring it was, I was the only one talking about it, to be quite honest. No one else was, there was no conference to go to to talk about it. There weren't even sponsorship conferences. So the fact that you are where you are today so, so early is just amazing to me, because it has taken sponsorship so long that even now, we don't have a conference on measurement of sponsorship. There's never been one. It's always sponsorship and a little sidebar where Jed and Bill speak about measurement. But no one has come together. We all talk about it. It's like, yeah, we got to do it. We got to do it uh, for all the same reasons you're talking about it. But there's no measurement where there's a lot of exchange of ideas. So I think you're so far ahead of the curve already. So I'm really happy to be here on, I guess, was just the first conference on measurement and, and placemaking. Um, Peter gave a little bit about my background. You're probably thinking, OK, why is somebody who's working on both speaking at placemaking? Um, but I did go to a different career in, in sponsorship. And I um, want to just tell you a little bit about performance research. And I'm also here with Jenny Mello, who has, um, really runs quite a bit of our business. And I'm going to refer to every so often, maybe, if not to scare her about it. But um, our mission is, is really pretty simple. And we've never deviated from this. It's to help clients capture and measure the value of sponsorship and experiential marketing. We added that in a couple years afterward. And reveal the essential truth about impact. And I think the key word here is truth. And I'll just tell you a little bit story about how I got involved in this and to, that kind of describes what I mean about truth. When I had finished a program in sports management and had studied about corporate sponsorship, although the term was not really even coined back then, but was trying to do some academic work on the value of it. And when I got out of school, typical, where do I find a job? And at the time, there were about two or three major sports marketing firms. Uh, one of them you may have heard of is called IMG. They're still around. They're a huge global company. And I, the person who had um, started IMG had written this book, What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. And one of the, the uh, themes of the book was just go out and grab what you want. Do, you know, don't stop. You just be smart, be aggressive, but don't give up your dream. And my dream was to work for IMG. And this is, of course, back in the days of typewriters, way before internet and, and even computers. I typed off, I can't really type, a bunch of letters, sent them, and sent them through snail mail, waited forever, never heard anything from about the 15 or 16 letters I sent to different executives at IMG. So I decided, well, I'm going to take his attitude. And I actually called him directly and got his secretary, which kind of surprised me, and just said I was really frustrated <laughs> because no one has returned a call. And so she goes, well, let me relay your message to Mr. McCormick. And you know, she didn't say he was going to get back to me or anything. But she actually called back the next day. And she said, Mr. McCormick was so embarrassed by that no one in his company has responded to you. He set up an interview with you tomorrow in New York with the corporate consulting department. Can you attend? Well, like, yeah, of course I can attend. So I get there, and the guy that I met with was so mad at me because he's like, he said, I've never been in trouble with my boss before, and you somehow, some kid out of college, got me in trouble. And he goes, so tell me about what you think you could do for IMG. And I told him about my idea to set up a whole division, division meaning me, of doing measurement of corporate sponsorship. And he kind of got a little bit intrigued. And then he brought some more people in the room. He goes, tell them again. And then you know, I told him again. And then they, somebody said, oh, I want to bring so-and-so in. So by the end of the, this three-hour session, there are about six or seven people in the room. And I thought, you know, I'm carrying my briefcase with nothing in it, because there was nothing to carry. But I thought, I'm going to walk out with some sort of contract on, on what to talk, you know, how I'm going to work here. And um, I was already excited about living in New York and everything. And anyway, they asked me to leave the room for a little bit. And I thought, this is where, where the offer is going to come back. And I go back in, and they, they said, well, we're really um, pleased you came in today. You've, you've generated a lot of discussion. And they said, but to be quite honest, we don't want you. And we don't want your, what you're talking about at all. And I was like, 
okay, you know, I thought it was going well up until this point. And um, they said, we sell sports on the glitz and glamour of it. And to be quite honest, we don't know if there is any value. And if we go out and try to prove it, we could just ruin this company. And I was like, wow, that's talking about the truth. That's not any truth in there. So I got home that night and I, and I was um, telling somebody about it. I said, well, why don't you just start your own company to do this? And I was like, great idea. And so that's how performance research got started. And that's why the truth has always stuck with us, because we are always about the truth. And we just never want to deviate from that. And um, that has been our mission. So anyway, that's a lot of story for one slide. Um, to give you a, a little more background, we were the first born sponsorship research company. Um, we studied about 750 separate corporate sponsored programs to date. Uh, we're working or have worked for 12 of the top US um, sponsors as clients. Uh, we have global reach right now. We're working in Russia, Japan, China, um, Brazil, Mexico. We span around. Um, and you can kind of see on the right some of the different things that we work on. It's not all just sports, although because more money is spent in sports than other types of sponsorships, that's where we usually um, end up. And then you can kind of see at the very bottom that we, we talk about arts venues a little bit, and we have done a lot of sponsorship research in the arts. Um, our company motto is see yourself as others see you. And we use this I in a lot of our reports, and it was on our back when we had brochures, and it's on our website, which we're changing anyway. And I think the I is a little creepy because, but in a way, it's a good thing because it's like somebody's looking at you. And that to me is what evaluation is all about. It's not how you see yourself, it's how other people see you. And we often don't want to know how, it's, it's the difficult question to ask. I, don't, I personally don't even like looking in the mirror. I avoid department stores because there are mirrors everywhere. And I was like, oh, God, like, I, I don't want to like, look at this. And um, we just, do we want that, val we want validation in a positive way, but do we really want the constructive criticism? And I think most people say they do, but they really are uncomfortable with it. And we have to get over that uncomfortableness to say we're going in the right direction. And that's probably the biggest hurdle, I think, of anything in sponsorship measurement or measurement per se, is getting back the information. And what we always tell our clients, it's not a report card that you're getting back. You're getting back a story about yourself. And part of that story is going to be a lot of motivation on things to improve. So it's, not, it's a process. It's not a snapshot in time that you are doing things right or doing things wrong. It's feedback that will help generate ideas to improve what you're doing. So in the end result, it's going to make your life easier. And if you don't know, if you have your eyes shut to how other people see you, you could ultimately fail, even though that's what you were afraid of in the beginning. So don't be afraid of the research or measurement. Be afraid of failing without it. All right. Every company, I'm just going to let this video run, because I think it's kind of cute, um, partly because there's two of our clients, one um, AAA and the other M&Ms, and here they are smashing into each other. So, <laughs> so it's going to run on and on while I talk. Every company is known for something, and I have to say what we are most known for is one of the very, very first projects that we ever did. And it was for Kodak Film when they started getting involved in NASCAR racing. And it was the very first project, and I, they called and um, said, can you measure, we have a brand new car in NASCAR. To be quite honest, I wasn't even sure what NASCAR was. I just hadn't followed it as a kid or whatever. I mean, I, kinda, I guess I knew what it was. I was picturing working in golf and tennis and things like that, never in motorsports. And um, they said, can you go to Talladega, Alabama, which is going to be our first race, and measure this for us? I was like, OK, I think we can do that. And they said, that's good, because every other company we called said no. <laughs> so I was like, OK, we have a new adventure. So anyway, we did all this research through the whole summer in Talladega and Charlotte and uh, Michigan and other tracks around the country. And basically, there was only one question that they wanted answered. How brand loyal are NASCAR fans? Because they didn't want to sponsor it if they weren't brand loyal. And we came up with this number that 72% of NASCAR fans would preferentially select a sponsor's product over a non-sponsor's product. So this was back in 1986. And what's so weird is this number still permeates the sponsorship world. People come to us and they say, how do we compare to that 72%? I'm like, how do you know about the 70%? And it's like, it's all over the internet. I'm like, this was forever ago. But it's, it sticks in their mind as a benchmark that NASCAR holds kind of the leadership position in brand loyalty. And maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But I think there's always some sort of benchmark or baseline that people use for comparison purposes. And if loyalty is a strong objective, NASCAR has always been that in sponsorship. Um, just so you think, we're, I'm not going to talk about NASCAR all day long or other sports. We actually do work in quite a lot of the arts areas. And this is some of that we just 
um, when I was putting the list together, I was, I was kind of surprised. Well, we've been to a lot of venues and, that are, have arts. So um, even though I consider myself working in the sports world, I realized that alongside a lot of other people in our company, we, we have done a lot of evaluation in the arts. And I think the principles are pretty much all the same. Alrighty, our approach. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Clients come to us for a lot of different reasons. And um, generally, they come to us, I think, for some of the wrong reasons. I think the right reason that they should come to us is when they say, what should we do? In other words, let's, let's do some research about what's going to be the best sponsorship for us. Unfortunately, we're still kind of in the dark ages where sponsors think they have the best ideas, and sometimes the CEO has the be very, very best idea. And so they go off and they sponsor something without doing a whole lot of research beforehand on how it's going to impact their brand. So I would say only about 5% to 10% of our research is actually in the place where it would really matter the most. Um, the next part is kind of a little bit down the line. How can we optimize what we do? And that's when they come to us with a program and they say, all right, we realize we've, we've signed on to this sponsorship, whether it be in sports or arts or entertainment or theme parks, whatever it is. What can we do to make ourselves stand apart, all the other sponsors in there? And that's when we'll actually talk to people who are fans of this this activity or follow this activity or whatever, and feel like, try to decide what it is that a sponsor can do that makes a difference. How can they become more rele relevant? How can they be an authentic sponsor in this? How can they add more value? Um, and that's probably where, where most of our work really lies right now and what we like to do best. Um, one of the most common, though, is also how did we do or how are we doing? And this is kind of the report card effect where somebody says, I, you know, I've just spent $5 million of my company's money. Now somebody's asking me why. And so they say, can you help us? And it's surprising to me how many times we get this call. We will get a call the day after the Olympics ends. And somebody say, can you do any research on the Sochi Olympics? And we're like, yes, maybe you might have called us a year ago. And they'll say, my boss is asking for a report. What can you do? It, it happens every year. And it, it's just, uh, so it's always like this kind of thing. How are we doing? How did we do? And that's maybe what we're talking about in placemaking. But it doesn't have, don't think of measurement as just of that kind of report card. And the final one is now what we do, and these are always my favorite kind of projects. This is where something goes wrong in the sponsorship world. Um, I can think of a well, real recent example. Again, I could use NASCAR because we do so much work in it, where a, a, one of our clients had a, has a driver that is just really the bad boy of the sport, and he just crosses the line too often. And is it really devaluing this brand? Uh, a major sponsor of the Olympics came to us. Um, this is going back in years. Um, during the bribery scandal of the um, Salt Lake City Olympics and said, do we want to be associated with this? Or can we, can we use research on how the IOC brand has been devalued so we can get some money back? Um, but these are the, we're doing one now in, in a woman's sports that has kind of an image problem. So th these are the kind of the things that I most like to do because I feel like we can make a real difference in these. Um, we don't often go into a client with any sort of scales and saying how we're going to measure things. But I do want, did want to put this up on what has been typical in the sponsorship research world, and maybe you'll see some applications for yourself. When it started, and I didn't actually ever subscribe to this, the measurement was very, very quantitative, very, very precise. It was how, about audience ratings. How many people attended this event? How many people watched it? What are the Nielsen ratings? And if our logo showed up so many times, what's the value of that? Well, to me, the value it's a dollar value. I don't know if that's really what, that's never what I intended to measure, but it was what was easy to measure and what people just seemed to, was kind of the right thing at the time. Um, and so those kind of mid, 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 media equivalency testing and things, people would take this information back to their boss and say, hey, look, you know, we spent a million dollars for the sponsorship, but we got $2 million in equivalent value. So therefore, I made a great decision, right? And they said, yeah, probably right. I would say, maybe you did, but you, don't really, you didn't really go further down the line. Because it's not about who you're reaching, it's about what happened after you're reaching. So we start, where we start is after that, and measuring the awareness of things, measuring how brand imagery is changing, measuring loyalty. But my most favorite part, and I think the most important part, and this is where I think the arts comes in, it's about the passion and the bonds that are created. And this measurement is often ignored by so many people, but this, where our key, where our, Big name clients are, and I'm talking about companies like Visa, like Anheuser-Busch, like Allstate, um, there, <laughs> there are lots of them. They, they are convinced now that they, when they go into a major sponsorship, sure, they can get those easy measurements down the end. They're very precise. But what I say, they're precisely the wrong thing to look at. But when we get to these vaguer things, they may be vague, but they're vaguely right, because this is where you make a difference in people's minds and hearts. 
And that's what sponsorship is all about. It's making a difference that's long lasting, that people can relate to, that they can carry with them forward. And so almost everything we do now, whether we measure in that little middle part, we're always taking it further. How did people, what was their passions? What was retained really in their heart? And I think the reason this is so important is that things that are in your heart, and I, I firmly believe the arts rest right in this, they're resistant to trends. Your, sentence, your, your senses are a little bit heightened, and it becomes contagious. People talk about things that they really enjoyed, what they love. They don't talk about seeing a sign someplace, but they will talk about what's something they did that really made a difference to them. And it becomes more memorable, and they will even talk about it years afterwards. So the sponsorship can continue on and on and on. So that whole idea of timelessness, really, that's when sponsorship pays off. So we are always pushing our clients measure in that more, less precise, but more emotional side of things. Um, this has been talked about. I've only attended a few of the sessions, um, and I've heard this question over and over again. And measurement is tough, and I don't really need to spend much time on this. There's no standard unit of measurement. And to be quite honest, a lot of people use this as an excuse for not doing measurement. Oh, there's no standard unit. It's you know, like we don't have a ruler for this, so I guess we won't bother because I don't want to do the wrong thing. Or maybe that gives me license not to do anything at all. Well, that's just not the right answer at all. The reason there's no standard unit of measurement in sponsorship, well, probably because I tell people there shouldn't be, but the other reason is that sponsorship is, there's no such thing as sponsorship effectiveness in any general or abstract sense. It can only be effective in accomplishing specific goals or specific objectives. So when I go to a client, I say, what are your goals? What are your objectives out of this? And to be quite honest, a lot of times they don't even know. I just had a conversation yesterday with a major energy company in, in Michigan, and we just started working on a project, and I asked them this, and there were four people on the other end of the line, somebody from marketing, somebody from sponsorship, somebody from advertising, and somebody from finance. And there was complete silence. I thought something happened to my iPhone. Which I, was like, I was like, are you still there? And they said, oh, yes, we're looking at each other for an answer. I was like, that's amazing, because they're in the multi-billion dollar category of sponsorship, and you can't tell me a single reason why you do this. And so they finally came up with one, which was a good answer, but they had to, they had to struggle with it. But again, it's, I, I said, well, I can measure against that objective. Can, can you come up with any more? And they said, you tell, you tell us, which, why should we be doing this? And so, so I gave them a checklist, and they go, yeah, that's a good one, that's a good one. Well, you know, again, we have to put our minds, what are the objectives we're doing this? Then we can see what's measurable within that and go measure it. There's also this reliance on easy feedback. Research is not necessarily easy. Sometimes it is. But don't go just for the easy stuff. See what's hard, see what you can do, but try to, try to go the whole length if you can. Um, we tend to focus on volume rather than value. And I already spoke about that. How many people saw this? How many people came through? Um, economic impact, which we do a lot of studies. Uh, Jenny is um, responsible for our economic impact studies, serve a, a tremendous value to some of our clients. But it's still about volume type of thing. When we're talking about, I'm talking about value. Um, I think the other issue is that we also, I know this in sponsorship, and I'm guessing it's going to be the same in placemaking. We start on the defensive because we're asked to justify what we're spending. And you know, it's interesting because sponsorship money has always been very, um, come out of, it's taken away from advertising budgets and gone into sponsorship. And now for a lot of corporations, sponsorship actually, there's more spending in sponsorship than there is in advertising. But advertising never had to defend itself, really. But sponsorship, for some reason, because it was the new kid on the block, had to defend itself. And so we, we start by being defensive of it and looking for measurement to say, yes, we're valuable because. I'm not sure that's the right approach, but it does mean that we have to be able to defend what we're doing, that the research we're doing or the measurement we're doing is, in fact, telling the right and true story. Um, the other problem is answering the multiple constituents. I see this in sponsorship all the time. You have Basically, I think the person you, or the, the constituency you should answer to are the people that you're trying to appeal to. So in sponsorship, it's generally consumers. And if consumers don't like it, what difference does it make if anyone else likes it? Um, the CEO may beg to differ, but I don't think it, they should. It's really, but you have so many different people that are looking at the research, and no one, everyone has a say in it. But that's really hard to manage sometimes. So you have to decide what is the most important constituent that we want to address this research for, who's, reading, who's looking at it, who does it matter to, and kind of then break it down from there. And I think the final thing, and maybe I'll talk about, this is kind of similar to no standard unit, is in sponsorship, we don't have a lot of competition in performance research. And yet, through the 30, 28, 30 years that we've been in business, I can count almost 18, 18 to 20 different companies that have, have come into our space. And they always try to present a model that they have solved the solution to sponsorship research. But 
these complex models I don't think really work because there's always a different scenario. You come up with a model for one thing and then it doesn't work for another. I'm not saying that models are bad things, but we can never rely on a model, so to speak, to be the, the end-all answer to things. So just kind of keep that in mind as, the, as your industry moves forward. Okay, there's more obstacles. I sound like that ad of like, you know, like, and there's more if you buy it right now. There's more obstacles. Um, research is too costly. It doesn't have to be. Um, we can come up with a lot of ideas of how you can do research inexpensively on your own without hiring firms like us. Um, we talked about the fear of results. I don't think you should ever be fearful of results. You should be fearful of not knowing. And the big thing is you just don't even know where to start. And maybe that's where this conference is coming into play, is where to start. All right. Um, as I mentioned, Visa, they are one of our uh, biggest clients, and we work with them globally. Michael Lynch was a, uh, he's actually no longer there, uh, but he was famous in the sponsorship world because he, he kind of scared the rights holders, or what we call it the rights holders or the properties, in other words, the events that they're going to sponsor, because he was always holding them to task if, if the sponsorship was working effectively. And he said one day in a meeting to us, you can't manage, well, actually, it was a, we used to have these quarterly meetings where uh, at the time, Visa sponsored about eight to ten different properties, um, from the Olympics to NASCAR to Broadway, um, you name it. There was a lot of things. And they had a manager for each of those properties, and we would all come into a room, and we were doing a tracking study every day of the week on how, these sponsors, how effective these sponsorships are, are working. And he would, quarterly, we would have these group meetings, and everyone had to come into the room. And he would flip open this binder with our name on it and start going through the results. And he'd point to someone and say, hey, you Mr. Broadway, these figures went down 7% since last quarter. What do you have to say for yourself? And it was like the tension was just unreal. And it was a little unfair to do that. But what he really meant, what he was trying to do, is you have to pay to the measurement of this because you can't manage it or you can't manage it. And he actually said that in the meeting. I can't manage if we can't measure. And to me, this was the perfect client because it meant we had business for a very, very long time. But, but the more important part was that he was doing things with the way we were measuring. He was tweaking the sponsorships all the time to make them the most effective thing. And again, if you think of measurement as not a snapshot in time, but as something as a tool that you constantly use, this is the way Visa is doing it, and they're one of the preeminent sponsors in the industry. And I think it's the feedback, it's feedback, feedback, feedback. Help, research helps them do it better. So um, with that, I'm going to take you through a few research stories. I think I have four up here. I'm not 100% sure how applicable they are to the placemaking world. I chose them because I thought they might be. But this is where I particularly want you to ask questions. If, you, if, the, if, you, if I'm not making the bridge or if there's a question you have to kind of just say, what, why did you do this or what, you know, just what, anything, just raise a hand. Um, so I have four studies. I'm picking them out from 25 years of research. <laughs> um, and I'm never going to show a pie chart, which is really unusual for somebody who works in research not to do. So I'm just going to talk about them. The first one is uh, Coca-Cola. We started, um, when you work in sponsorship research, you're really excited when you get a call from Coca-Cola. And this was pretty early on, and we, I think this was in the mid 80s, no, no, I'm sorry, mid 90s, and we had started the company in 1986. So it had been a while while we were waiting to hopefully work with Coke one day. And they called my partner and I into their office, and they said to us, what do you think of our sponsorship? And we were all ready to go, our sponsorship program. And we were all ready to show them our credentials and you know, blah, 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 we can do this and that and that. We weren't expecting that question right off the bat. But we had known from working on so many other projects that how Coca-Cola did. Because if you, if you work for one client in football, Coca-Cola is probably there too. And you're going to see results, you know, data that has to do with Coca-Cola. And this would happen over and over and over again. And it was always our impression that Coke never really did that well. And so my partner Bill and I looked at each other like, oh, God, who's going to say this first? And Bill just, who's never shy about saying anything, he said, we think you waste all your money. And I was like, oh, boy, OK, this is going to be a really short meeting. And again, it reminded me of that meeting I had with IMG where there was like silence. And there was silence. And finally, the one guy looks around the room. And I don't even think he was the most senior person. And he said, finally, a company that tells us what we need to hear. And we were like, so they were like, tell us more. And we are like, you know what, you're just everywhere. And because you're everywhere, it doesn't mean any more to anyone. In fact, we use the word, you're like wallpaper. You go into a sports event, you see Coke, you go on, and then you just keep going. It doesn't mean anything. And you can kind of see, I mean, you, you know it just from seeing it. You've seen these signs everywhere if you go to any sports events. 
It's just Coke. You know, it's a Coke sign on the billboard. It's a Coke, Coke sign behind the concession stand. It's Coke here, the Coke there. And this is the way they operated. They would buy or rent, whatever you call it, every single sports property they could think of to put their sign up. But that's all they really did. And it was, we're talking in the millions and millions and millions of dollars of signs. And what we said is you have to be, and I know they were thinking this, they just needed help getting them there. You have to be more authentic. You have to be, add value to the experience. You have to be relevant to what people are doing here. And so we started this research study. Oh, actually, I, I'll let you read this quote. If you named a spot, this was from their director of what they call presence marketing, not sponsorship marketing, meaning we want to be there, presence marketing. If you named a sport or venue, we were there. The problem was the consumer didn't notice we were there. The consumer said that signage in these venues is nothing more than advertising. So he was basically using our words. So what's the difference between a sign in a bus shelter and one at a baseball stadium? Probably about a million dollar in fees, and the bus shelter is probably better for you. And he actually took, this was uh, published in the I, IEG newsletter, and he talked about this at the IEG conference, and it just, it just made all the properties in the United States just like go freeze cold. They're like, oh, great. Coke is now saying that all of us have no value. But that's not really what he was saying. It's, he was saying is the way we do it has no value. And that's what we were trying to show and trying to research. So we started out with this really interesting project. And I think I, it, it, when we were, I was in the, session, the first session with Anne yesterday, for some reason, I started seeing parallels to some of the things she was talking about. They had so many programs around the United States, we didn't even know where to start. I said, you know, knowing where to start is the hardest part. It was definitely the hardest part with them. And so what we decided to do was to pick one city. And in this case, it turned out to be Charlotte, North Carolina. And the goal was to study every single sponsorship they did in Charlotte, which is not, you know, Charlotte's not the biggest city in the world, but it's, it's sizable. And so we were studying sponsorships at things like movie theaters, at, at little leagues, um, the NASCAR race. Um, they kind of went the gamut from, from uh, there were some African-American festivals, music festivals, so food festivals and things. So it went, it went the whole range from big multi-million dollar things like the Coca-Cola 600 in Charlotte down to things that they were only spending a couple thousand dollars on. But we were going to put every one of these programs to the same, quote, criteria and way of studying. So we started doing on-site research at every single one of these events just to get a baseline of what, how Coke was perceived as a sponsor then. And then we started doing focus groups where we would talk to attendees or fans or however you want to describe them of these different events and really try to uncover what were their passion points or what we call emotional triggers. What, makes, what is the big thing that makes you love this? What is it about this event that if somebody took it away you would miss the most? What is it that make, makes you feel good when you're there? And again, I think this is what, the way art affects people. And what was interesting is that for I would say about 50% of the properties, we couldn't find any emotional trigger. And whether it was a fault of our research, possibly, but I think the, the bigger takeaway is because some, not every event has one. Sometimes they're just events, you know, people just go there because it's something to go do. And they were sponsoring a lot of these, let's just go there kind of things. And so, and some of these were big types of events too. So really what it came down to is if we couldn't find a unique passion point that a sponsor could I hate to use the word, but I'm going to use it, capitalize on, and to make a program more meaningful, they were going to drop that sponsorship, which they did. And they kept the ones where they could find something to build a program around it to make these sponsorship much more meaningful. And we did this for baseball, and we did this for, oh, I guess we did it for probably 30, 40 different programs around the country. But then the most interesting thing is after it was all done, we went back and did the same on-site research again to see what had changed. And... Um, these are just some examples of different things they've done and are still doing, um, you know, a tube park rather than putting a sign in a ski area. You know, put something where people can go do things. Um, they started sponsoring youth soccer, but it was bringing kids to, um, with actually, they were paying for kids to come in and play, and it was at a very high level, and it was just a lot more interactive than just having a sign someplace on a field. Um, fan festivals, which are still going on now in the NCAA Final Four, where it's not Coke sponsors the NCAA or March Madness, but they actually organize the whole fan fest. So it's all about experiences. One of my favorite things was this, these misting machines at hot events where you just go in and get cool. In fact, we had a, an interviewer who was doing so much research at events that she actually learned how to fix the mix, mix, misting machines when they broke down. <laughs> but, uh, or what, their best example was at the London Olympics this past summer, where I think it was called Drum Beep. It was most incredible exhibit I have ever seen, and, and definitely a place-making type of thing where you go in there and have this amazing experience. But it was all about creating experiences and creating memories. And I think the biggest thing is that when we went in and measured after, every single key performance indicator 
went way up. It just made all the difference in the world because it was all about the experience. And now, you know, Coke's, I think their thing is Coke, um, you pour happiness. And that's really what all the whole change in sponsorship philosophy was about. We went from being, or they went from being a, a company that put up signs to a company that created happiness through sponsorship. Okay, the second, second of four examples. Um, theme parks. Um, I often think of Disney as possibly, and I could be wrong, tell me if I'm wrong, as one of the originators of placemaking. Because they would create, particularly in a, a kind of a, a mind, if not physically, in a sense of, of mind, that they put you in a place that you weren't expecting to be, and that made you happy, and feel different, and feel good about yourself, and feel good about life. And so they were, in some ways, I saw them as originators. And one of the sponsors of Disney um, came to us, probably guess who it was. It was this, it, I don't know if anyone had been to um, Disney back in, when it originated, but GM sponsored World of Motion. You know, it's really hard in a place like Epcot, and you're trying to create an experience that's supposed to be futuristic. It's probably even impossible today to create something that is long lasting. Um, but they came to us and they said, we have an outdated space. It's meant to represent the future. All it really does now is show the past. Um, it's also our flagship showroom. We have more people come through the world of motion at Disney than if you, I don't know if this was true, but I think at the time they said, than if you put all our dealerships together. Um, maybe it is true. Um, and it was their big chance to impress. But they had this outdated, kind of ugly, boring thing. And they were not only boring their audience, they were really paling in comparison to other sponsors that had much better pavilions. So people are going to Disney and they're like, ugh, that, you know, that world of motion thing is kind of awful, don't go there. Um, not the thing you want to say when you're spending quite a lot of money to be at Epcot. So we did this really, I thought, fun research. Um, well, it was fun up to a point until you're on your about 300th mini focus group and then <laughs> it wasn't so much fun. But um, we actually took people right off the ride and we said, would you be willing to do a focus group right here, right now? And they were like many focus groups with like three or four people. What was the most interesting finding to me was no one ever refused. They all want to do it because everyone's always interested in the underground Disney. You know? And so we're like, you're going to have a chance to talk about what's going to happen here in the future. So we grabbed them right from the line. And we had all these concept boards of different ideas to test for a new pavilion and a new ride. And we tested and tested and tested every single aspect. Um, you know, whether it was about the sight, the sound, the, no the noise that they would hear, the feelings that they would experience. And then we kept interchanging all these different things to see what was going to be the best possible experience. And so again, I think this was a little bit about, maybe it's artificial, but creating a, a place-making environment. And where we netted out was that we, there was never a second wasted. That when you go to Disney, what's the biggest hurdle going to Disney? It's the lines. Probably 80% of our research was how to enter, entertain and engage people who are standing in a line. Because that's really where you have them the most. And so every part of the new, new test track, it's not that new anymore, it's probably time for a new update, there was something to be learned while you were standing in line or something to entertain you. And it was always about don't waste a moment of these, this person's experience. Um, the other thing is that we were able to give them in the new ride information that was fun and educational, but that they could walk away and say, I didn't know that GM did this, or I didn't know that they put this in their cars. And that had never really been done before. And so they walked away with it when we did the research, later research, of a knowledge that lasted, that was going to make a difference on the purchase level. And then, actually working with a company, and I said before I don't really like models, but we actually found a very sophisticated modeling company. And they were able to take the information that we were using, collecting on site, and actually put it into a model that showed a verifiable increase in sales among those who went to Disney, or went to, to, the, to Epcot. So again, it was proof that this investment was worthwhile. But I think not just the proof, it was the research up front that made every second count why people were there. Um, third of the of four is a snowboarding study that we did. And again, this is a, for a snack food company. And they said, you know, most of our consumers are kids or young adults. And it's really hard for us as sitting around in the office in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever, to really understand the passion points of kids. And we want to do something different, and we think it should be in snowboarding. And they go, but what we've been doing so far, we don't think is working. So we said, well, so what have you been doing so far? And they said, well, we, we've been having races at ski areas and putting our signs up you know, down the snowboarding race field. And then we've created a couple of snowboard parks where you know, there are jumps and things like that. And, we're, and our next question was, well, what do you 
do there? And they said, well, you know, we have signs. You know? So it was, it was a lot what we'd always been hearing. And we said, we, let's find out more about the passion points. Let's try to find something that can engage you a lot more strongly than just the signs here. And so we went to um, the ski areas, the, the snowboard ski areas, and found it to be an incredibly easy place to do research because all we had to do was jump on a chairlift with somebody and they were our respondent for the next 15 minutes and they really had no choice except to answer our questions. But there was, uh, we got a lot of information fast and the things we found out were not surprising to me because my partner's a snowboarder and he said, um, I know how to do this research. I've already done this research and you know, I, I know exactly what they're doing wrong and what these kids are thinking. And w what we found out, was, which Bill said he already knew, was that they are snow, this is going back in the early 90s, so it's not so much like snowboarding is today, but it was, this was this kind of the beginning phase of the snowboarding, that they wanted it to be anti-establishment and that they were adopting a new sport. And I think our, to our, our client, they were considered the opinion leaders of their group. If they could get them to use this product, then other people would use it too, because they were the cool kids. But because they want, the, our client wanted to be authentic, they didn't want to just put up the signs. You know, we told them to do that. They wanted to be relevant, integrated. So how do they do this? Well, OK, I already told you how we did this. Oh, then we also did rubber focus groups. Then we also just did video diaries of just watching where they were going, what they were doing on the mountain, who they were hanging out with, how many people they were with. Um, you know, was it mostly girls, mostly guys, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, the outcome, that there was a group mindset among these snowboarders, that they actually didn't go to the mountain as an individual and go down by themselves. They always went down in packs. And if anyone's a skier or a snowboarder, you know what I'm talking about. Particularly in the early days, you'd be trying to ski down, and then there'd be this huge like, cluster of people that you had to move around. And this was the snowboarding pack mentality. And that, I think most important, they preferred separation over inclusion. And what I mean by that is they wanted to be different. They wanted to be the bad kids, the anti-establishment, that kind of thing. But the biggest learning was they were actually aware of our client's sponsorship of various things, and they said, absolutely, we hate that. They said, you are trying to make us mainstream, and we're going to fight you all along the way. And it was like, wow, this is like information that, it was like the worst information in a way. But in, in a way, it was also, it was the best learning, because, okay, now what do we do? Because our clients just said, we're even more intrigued by these kids than we ever were before, because now we think they're even more opinion leaders, because they're going to say something unexpected and do something different. So we came up with this idea of, or actually I should say the snowboarders came up with idea because we were trying to find out what could they use, what, what would they need, of snowboarding huts where they could go in as a group, get away from the skiers, hang out with their, their peers, and hey, it would be a perfect place for our client to just have some snack food around for them to take for free. So they'd be giving something of value, not just of the space, um, but of you know, some low-key branding. Well, everything was going fine, they put these snowboard huts up on about four or five different mountains, and we discovered a new problem. And it was kind of funny to me, but we should have really anticipated it. Anyone, any guesses what the problem was? Skiers using them? That probably would have been a bigger problem. Um, what? Families? Oh, animals. Oh, no, that didn't happen. <laughs> but maybe these huts weren't up long enough for that to happen. What happened is they were just going in there to smoke pot. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have a family type of company sponsoring a venue that's basically a, a place to go smoke pot. So anyway, the snowboard huts came down and they kind of went on to other things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we did have the food there, yeah, 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 good point. So the final one, final one I'm going to talk about in just, I think, the seven minutes or so, I have five minutes I have left. Okay, well, it's not going to take me that long. <laughs> okay, then we'll have questions. Um, and I, I'm going to use one in the arts. And it's one of my favorite examples because I don't get personally involved in every single project we do, and this one I have been personally in, involved with from the very beginning. But a, um, because this project is still ongoing, I'm not going to identify the company, but it's a wealth management firm, and they sponsor contemporary art. And I would say you probably come, a lot of wealth management firms do, so you'll never know which one it is. <laughs> so I'm just going to, if no one's seen this quote, I know it's, it's good to put up quotes once in a while. Um, this book was written probably 15 years ago, but I don't think it's all that outdated. I think this was the first time in a major marketing business type book that somebody actually put in a quote that art sponsorship works. And I, I think he was absolutely right that art sponsorship, you do come out of the gate ahead of everything else because you are doing something distinctive and unexpected. And this is probably incredibly valuable for placemaking because 
people don't expect things, and so it's, it's new territory. Anyway, I'll just keep going on. Um, so our client came to us and they said, well, this is our situation. Um, we're sponsoring contemporary art, but we're not doing it just in the United States. We want, and not just in Western Europe, we're doing this in China, we're doing this in Russia, we're doing this in South America. And we need to find out, is the message of contemporary art the same across the globe? In other words, we are using this as a platform to build our brand, but do people listen to us in the same way in New York as they will in Rio? It's a good question. You know, I didn't know how to answer that. Um, and I think the other part that made the project interesting is because they were looking for high net worth people or people that I would consider maybe even ultra high net worth where uh, investable um, amounts of five million plus, it was a very difficult audience to find. Um, not so much difficult for them to find, but for us to go do the research, it was a little difficult to find. And they also said, you know, we know in the arts world, we got to be careful. We, we want to be understated, but we want people to know that we're there and we want them to understand what we're doing. So it, was, it had all these dimensions to it, but, but very, very interesting to me. Um, so we started out, we've done focus groups in Europe, um, US, Asia, South America. Um, and then we did pre-post online surveys in all the markets that they were going to be exhibiting or doing their things. And then we did on-site intercepts at events. Now, the co very cool part about this is that, well, for me personally, is that they're so particular about the research and updating it is that we've actually done this research three times in six years. So it's been a round-the-world trip for me and, and just talking about art. And it's always been learning experiences. Um, I just pulled some, no, I know you can't read these things, so I will read them, <laughs> some of them too, um, from focus groups that people commented. And this is one that we just did last year. Um, some of the better ones, the best chance of emotional influence is providing timely help. And what that person meant is that sponsorship in the arts is, is help, that that's where sponsorship comes in. Because some of these exhibits, they knew would not exist without a sponsor being involved. Um, the moment the subject became interesting, you notice the sponsoring. In other words, what this person was referring to, when I got interested in the art and what they were doing, then I became interested in who the sponsor was. Um, if a sponsor does something that's selfless, a real commitment to the people, that counts. Again, that works well with art. If I notice a sponsor and I think, thank you, otherwise this, thing, this great thing wouldn't take place, that's emotion. That's exactly what we wanted to happen. And here they were saying, yes, yes, yes. If you do it right, this is the way we're going to respond. Um, so the outcome was that they are, we think they are doing it right. They found that art is a universal language. It really didn't matter where they are. Although people didn't necessarily understand or have the same appreciation for contemporary art, they understood it, what they understood was the same. And so our client was pleased with that. Um, the biggest finding, which I probably already alluded to, was that the whole idea of over-commercialization is unfounded. And I'm sure a lot of you are saying, no, I bet it's not. But we have not found a single piece of evidence of an art sponsor overdoing it yet, ever. And, and I showed you, I think, beforehand about 16 to 25 different arts programs we work on. Where there's the fear of over-commercialization, I think, lies with the people who manage the arts. It's not with the people who go to look at the arts. And the reason is, is because there is the knowledge and understanding that without some level of commercialization, money will not get poured into this. And money drives the events and drives the exhibits. And so that give and take is very, it's an easy thing to accept. And I think arts sponsors have been fairly careful to not over-commercialize. And so maybe that's why we haven't seen this, but yet we have never seen an example. And I, I was trying to think, I think it was the Tate Museum in London. And um, I'm thinking, this was a while ago, so I think the sponsor was BA, British Airways. And I remember walking into the exhibit. You know, like, do you ever take like those moving walkways, like in the airport, and they say, you know, pay attention, it's going to stop, or you have to get off? Well, this, this was the noise as you walked into the exhibit. It said, reminder, this is sponsored by British Airways. Without them, this would not have happened. I thought, how perfect. And some people would say, that's tasteless. I thought it was like, that's a really interesting thing to say. It doesn't have to be with a, a voiceover, but it should be in the program someplace. But people do need to be reminded that the money came from someplace and somebody was willing to take money that could have gone to sports and put it into the arts. And so these gentle reminders are very much important. Um, and I think the key thing is people want to know that. They want to be informed about the corporate support. Don't hide it. Bring it to the surface. And it's you, the people who are the organizers of the art, that are the most credible people to talk about it. If the sponsor talks about themselves, 
It's one thing, but if you talk about them and what they're doing, it means a whole lot more. And the final takeaway is that, and our client really laughed at this, arts aren't that much different from something else that we studied. Anything else? Anyone have a guess what it is? Sports. sports? Close. Any particular sports? NASCAR. NASCAR. And it's, it's so obvious because NASCAR fans know that those cars will not run around the track without the sponsor names on it. And without those sponsor names, there's no race to go see. And arts people know the same thing about art. So oh, I'm going to do this really quick. Five lessons, if I'm going to sum it up. And they're mostly a repeat of things I've already said. Um, making an impression does not equal counting impressions. So just think, don't think always quantitatively. Don't always think about economic impact. Think about what difference you're making to people in their lives and when you do your research and evaluations. Um, if there's no passion, there's probably no value. I think you know what I'm saying here. But it's all about the passion. And there's no sense in quantifying something that people don't really care about in the first place. So when you see that passion, see how you can measure it. See how you can contain it and describe it and tell a story about it. Um, the experience always overrides visibility. It's what people do. It's not what they see that counts. And this is, I think, perfect for placemaking. Um, ROI and return on objectives should also include what I call return on the experience and return on the relationship. And for a sponsor standpoint, it is about the relationship people have. Um, in fact, we never use the word ROI in any evaluation we do. We sometimes use ROO for return on objectives. But more and more, we use return on experience and return on relationship. Um, and I think the last most important one, and you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe this, but that measurement helps build programs. It doesn't tear them down. So never be afraid of it. Always be courageous out there. Measure research. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I guess we have like two minutes, three minutes. <laughs> Yeah, since I talked about it for an hour, I should probably be able to tell you how we do it, which is really the harder part. And it, it differs depending on what the client is doing. It's more qualitative. Um, in fact, it is purely qualitative to some extent, um, where we just ask people different ways of how, what they're, to give you an example, um, maybe that's a better way of doing it. We were doing a study not too long ago in baseball. And you know, baseball has a huge following. And, you know, well, I'm not particularly a baseball fan, but that's a huge following. And we asked people, what is it about baseball that you, you know, makes you go, makes you pay attention? And you would, it was not surprising to me, but I think our client was surprised. It was not necessarily about the World Series. It was not necessarily about their home team or about their favorite stars, which is kind of the answers you hear in some other sports. What it was, it was about the smell of it. They go, I go to a field and I can feel it. And then they would say things it brings back memories of going with my dad. It makes me want to have kids. Um, things like this. It's, it was not anything that had to do with the sport. Nothing. And so that's emotion. And when we, when we find things like that, and those are the emotional triggers that we're looking for. Another similar example, um, because it wouldn't seem obvious, was football. But in this particular case, our client was an um, orange juice company. And we were talking about football, and we were particularly talking to moms. And certainly there were a lot of women that were football fans. But again, it wasn't anything about the sport. They said, what was coming back to it, they said, what it is about football that makes me a fan is that this is a level playing field for me. Well, I shouldn't have used a sport example. <laughs> this is a way I can talk to my family and my kids. We can talk football, football and communicate on the same level. But the most important thing is I know where my family is going to be on Sunday afternoon, and we're all together. So it was about family. And that's our, our client looked for a way to tie into the whole family aspect. Um, in a quantitative way, we're doing it right now for a client that we're measuring um, a tracking study where we, we do online research every day of the week on college sports. We just ask people, how passionate are you right now at this moment about college sports? And they just rank it on a scale. And it's really interesting because we take the results and we analyze them by this very simple passion meter. And when we see the passion go up during things like times of um, bowl games or March Madness, we'll actually see a spike in the results that our client gets. So, I mean, those are a couple examples. But even qualitative, just one-on-one -on -one interviews. You can also measure passion through video intercepts, 
We go, we go with cameras to events a lot of times and just walk up to people and say, hey, tell us about what you're doing right now. I had, I had the great opportunity once of having lunch with Jane Goodall. And I was telling her about these video intercepts that we were doing in NASCAR. And she's walking up to fans. And she, she looked, looked at me and she said, you know, that's not a whole lot different than what I was doing with chimpanzees. <laughs> and she goes, but, but what you were doing was, seems a lot scarier in some ways. <laughs> so it's just, there's a, that's a free way to do it. Sometimes you just go sit, you know, just go sit with people at your event or stand where whatever you know you're doing, and just talk to them. A conversation is a great way to get an idea of passion. So, yeah. So uh, I work in theater, and I see a lot of theaters shift from the Ford Theater to the American Airlines Theater, and you know I know they've been there for a hundred years on on Forty Second Street, but suddenly it's like oh we're under a new overlord now. So I have a very uh, just uh, I don't know knee jerk negative response to it. And, down the street from where I live in Wallingford, Connecticut, is Oakdale. That's also an old roadhouse that's been there forever. And now it was like the Chevrolet Roadhouse, the Chevrolet Oakdale. And it was 1-800-Florist Oakdale. And then it was Toyota Oakdale. So can you just explain what's happening and what? why that happens? <laughs> that it just keeps like shifting. And what's, what's happening inside those well, companies? Well, first of all, it's not, I, I'm that. with you. It's not good. But it's not necessarily bad either. Um, in fact, I had a call, well, it wasn't a call, I was working on a survey yesterday for a client that came to us and said that they sponsor a theater and they think it's not bringing them anything. And not bringing them any value. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> it's not. Um, because to me, a name on the outside is the wrong place to be. You want to be with the people on the inside. So they walk in and they see your name, big deal, and then they go have a great time, but they don't remember who you are or have, you don't have anything to do with it. Um, yeah. It's just a novice, sort of simple-minded approach that you're going to put the name up there, and that's going to be the answer. So it fails. So the next name goes up, so it fails, and it's not integrated into the yeah. experience. I mean, there, there are some concrete reasons why it happens. And first of all, it's an easy buy. It's, it's more like a media buy um, than it is a sponsorship. Um, the other is for, th you notice a lot of banks do it and a lot of airlines do it because banks are often concentrated in a particular metropolitan area, and airlines often have hubs. So they want to get their name into the community in that way. The problem is, with both banking and airlines, the names change all the time. And so then the, the names on the venues have to change all the time, and no, no one can keep track. We, we did some studies very early on when the very first um, arena started getting renamed. And uh, what we found, and we've actually replicated this research, what we found is if, it was the, if the name of an existing place was being changed to accommodate a sponsor. It was a completely negative reaction because people had all these good memories and you know, these things were iconic. And how dare you all of a sudden plaster a name on, on it. But if you put a name to a brand new facility and you communicated that this otherwise would not have happened without the sponsor, then it was a complete acceptance of it. So. I'm curious about the negative reaction that some consumers might have to certain sponsors. I used to manage an orchestra in North Carolina, and we used to seek out funding from Philip Morris, for example. And then I came into another environment with another orchestra where Philip Morris was not as revered as it was in North Carolina for fairly obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get around something like that? I, I'm not sure. We, I used, we used, Philip Morris used to be a client of ours. And I, I remember... Um, thinking at the time that I might have some trouble with this. But then a lot of their money was coming out of a foundation. And I, it's interesting, because there's foundation money, and then there's marketing money. And I think for Philip Morris, it, it kind of worked, because it, it would often say, supported by the Philip Morris Foundation or, or whatever. Um, I actually don't know how to answer that question, to be quite honest. If somebody else wants to give it a try. It's... I have a question. Um, so if you could clarify for me, I think I'm, if you did already, I may have missed it. You were saying about baseball that um, the people you surveyed had these very different responses to baseball than you expected. Right. That there were not, you know, there were not really much to do with the actual sport, but these emotional responses. How can you make, well, how can you make a case then for baseball being sponsored? I mean, it's, it's an association that they're making, whether relevant or not. How can you manage that? Because you started off by saying, you know, management is the issue. How does a sponsor then decide, yeah, this is where I want to be, and this is where I want to be in that whole experience? This, then it, it, comes, it comes down to the creative minds at those organizations or that work for those properties to say, can we integrate a sponsor that is going to do something to add value? And if they wreck, the whole idea of, of knowing these passion points is so that a sponsor doesn't appear as a stranger to the environment. If they can express in whatever communication possible that they are a fan the same way you are a fan, 
and it's as valuable to them as it is to the people who, that, that it's, it becomes a common language. So I can't say that our sponsor actually went and created something around the smell of grass, but they got a sense of what not to do, and they got a sense of, and, and they actually leveraged the whole um, family aspect of father to son kind of thing. And, in, in your experience, have the arts organizations that have been sponsored by corporate uh, sponsors achieved the 72% uh, rating that mm -hmm. you strive for in other fields? Yeah, we have seen it, actually. Um, we have. And it, you know, it varies on different programs, so to speak. And it, def it varies a lot on who is, who is coming to, you know, it's a lot about the demographic that's coming. Um, the, basically, the higher the socioeconomic level, the somewhat lower you get in the appreciation, or that, or the expression, I, should say, I shouldn't say the appreciation, somewhat lower that they will actually say, yes, I am going to go out and buy their product. And yet we still see evidence of it. So um, I would say arts ranks near the top, if not right alongside NASCAR. But even that, I don't like to use that ranking because that's not what it's all about. It's not just about loyalty to sponsors, so. Do you, do you have any, um sage advice for local, working locally with local corporations, organizations, um, in terms of a new initiative. So we have sponsors who are very uh, supportive. They sponsor, you know, little bits of money throughout the year for all of our events. But if we're looking to start some new initiatives, and there's that, like, it's unproven, but here's our history, you know us, but, you know, you want to attach your name to this because this is going to be really cool, but there, you know, there's that moment where and we really need them to do it. Yeah, um, I don't, nothing I say is really like sage advice, but um, the what advice I would give is two things. One is don't ever talk about your need, talk about their needs. Um, no one want, ever wants to sponsor a needy anything, really, <laughs> quite honest. And uh, the other is probably the thing that will get their attention is that corporate sponsors, Coke isn't just competing against Pepsi, and Allstate isn't competing against State Farm, per se, in the sponsorship world, they're competing against every other company out there that's fine for the attention. And if you have a program that will absolutely differentiate that sponsor from every, what everyone else is doing, it's new, it's different, it's exciting, it'll get talked about. That's, that's the, that may be the best. Um, I'm curious with the rise of CSR in recent years, does any of your research look into that and as uh, sponsorship dollars are getting shifted more into their CSR units and they're kind of developing their own initiatives instead of going outwards necessarily, they might find a partner from the outside, but they're really being driven from inside the, the company. We haven't worked on a whole lot in that area. What we do work on is, is with the traditional sponsorships is having a CR, CSR um, side to it because that's often where people see more value. There's, a, there's guilt, you know, this happened in the economic downturn you know, a few years ago. There was a lot of guilt in sponsorship. Here you are spending money, and there's, you know, for what? <laughs> you know, and it's like people are, it just wasn't working. And we had actually had clients pulling signs down off of things like golf tournaments and so forth. But, but our advice was improve what you're doing from a social perspective, and you will get a lot more mileage out of it. And I don't know if this was part of your question, but sometimes I think our clients, they don't want to just be perceived as a company as check written by. They want to be perceived as a company involved, hands-on. And so that kind of initiative from within is probably a good thing. And it's often, it takes people like you to give them the idea, but let them steal the credit for it. Does that make sense? I work for an orchestra and a music school, and we have a big um, uh, arts education program within the public schools. Uh -huh. And just to end on a great note, you know, one of the things that you're talking about, it's uh, the qualitative stuff, our surveys that we do with the kids and the teachers after uh, they come and, you know, perform and sing with the orchestra. Uh -huh. And um, Hasbro was one of our big sponsors here in Rhode Island, and they uh, s supported an entire school district to come to concerts and sing and play with the orchestra. And when the surveys came back to us, the most important one to the company was one of the kids literally said, the next time I go buy a toy, I'm going to buy a Hasbro toy. That's great. That's exactly what they want to hear. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? Okay. I, I want to just really recommend to everybody that there were so many powerful, great ideas in, in what you said. And, and the thing that really struck me most was really these examples about what people emotionally said about baseball, et cetera. And I really want to recommend this work by Alan Brown. There's a piece that he wrote for Grantmakers in the Arts 
where he's, t he's talking about how he's done a lot, a lot of participant research, probably some of the best in the country in arts and culture. And he's finding that people really care much more now about the venues and the places in which they experience arts and culture rather than just the play or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And that many of them are rejecting the kind of traditional spaces where there's a huge separation between the audience and, and the performers and that there's a lot more use of outdoor spaces and everything else. And I think that we could, as a field, could really, I don't, we can't afford you, or, but we need this kind of research on how people who we often think of as audiences, we spend a lot of money trying to figure out you know, how to get people back into orchestra halls and everything else, but what, what does really drive people's participation in the arts? And I, I, there were just some really good ideas. I really want to thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I was, it was fun being here. Thanks very much.